Hello Chem 213 students and welcome back for this week's lectures. This week we've got chapter 25 amino acids, peptides, and proteins. So we got a picture here of some egg stuff and some meat stuff. Contains a lot of protein, wheat bread even, uh, with some protein in there. Um, as we begin to talk about proteins, there are some important uh, factors or some important uh, things that you have learned before that will be relevant for this chapter. One is stereochemistry, again, uh, very important just like in carbohydrates uh, in our last chapter here. Carboxylic acid, so the acid and amino acid is carboxylic acid and the nucleophilic acyl substitutions of carboxylic acids and carboxylic acid derivatives will be important to the way amino acids chain together to form polypeptides and uh, large polypeptides also referred to as proteins um, and finally uh, the amine in amino acid refers to amines and so the uh, properties of amines uh, uh, will be important for this as well so uh, you've probably heard amino acids before um, in terms of like sports drinks and stuff uh, and so uh, proteins are polymers of compounds called amino acids and so these amino acids their name comes from the fact that they have amine groups and carboxylic acid groups uh, so we can see here these are examples here of amino acids they have an amine group here primary amine uh, and a carboxylic acid and each of these amino acids have these and they join together in a condensation reaction in which water is removed so one hydrogen is removed from the nitrogen and an OH group is removed from the carbon and you get a joining between uh, the carbon on one amino acid and the nitrogen on another and you can see those bonds here in the completed protein that has a bond directly from the carbonyl carbon to the nitrogen and so you make a bond between amino acids and that bond forms a amide group. Uh, so proteins have series of amide groups that are separated by a single carbon atom. The R here represents uh, what's going to be called a side chain for the protein and that side chain will differ depending on which amino acid that we're talking about. That's how one amino acid differs from another. So uh, these are referred to also as alpha amino acids with the carbon, the alpha carbon being the one right next to the carbonyl group, what we would call the alpha carbon or right next to the amine group too. Uh, so it's the carbon right between these two functional groups. The, the amine and the carboxylic acid, acid functional group are separated by one carbon, again referred to as the alpha carbon, and the amino acid side chain will be uh, also bonded to this alpha carbon. Um, all al alpha amino acids are going to be chiral. Uh, the alpha carbon is the chiral center. Uh, there is one exception though, and, and that is glycine, um, and for reasons that we'll see in a moment. So when we have a series of uh, amino acids chained together in the way that we saw before, these are referred to as peptides, meaning short amino acid chains containing less uh, around 40 to 50 amino acids or less. And um, if we have a, a peptide that involves two amino acids, we call it a dipeptide. If it is a chain of three amino acids, we call it a tripeptide. Four would be tetrapeptide and so forth. Uh, and then once we get more than a few peptides, we can refer to these as a polypeptide a chain with uh, fewer than 40 to 50 amino acids. And the bond uh, here forming the amide, so here's our amide group, and that bond between amino acids that is formed by where that amide is, that is referred to as a peptide bond. The bond between the carbonyl carbon on one, uh, one um, amino acid and the amine on the other. And so polypeptides, meaning many of these peptide bonds. Uh, larger chains, larger than about 40 or 50 amino acids, will be called proteins, although proteins generally imply that they have an actual biological function. Uh, but even if you have, let's say, synthesized, uh, which this, which can be done, let's say you synthesize a uh, polypeptide that is 100 amino acids or 200 amino acids, probably someone would call that at that point a protein, even if it isn't a biological polypeptide. 
Um, there are 20 alpha amino acids that occur naturally. They differ uh, by the identity of their R group. And so uh, we can see here there are two uh, examples of amino acids that contain different R groups. So here's the amino group, here's the carboxylic acid, and here's the alpha carbon. So the alpha carbon has one hydrogen attached and it has the side chain for the, for the protein. In, case, in the case of alanine, that side chain has the identity of uh, methyl. Uh, in the case of serine, it's a uh, CH2OH, so it has one carbon and, and that carbon contains a hydroxyl group attached. Uh, and you can see that this is analogous to the arrangement here of a small carbohydrate in the terms of that uh, a small, uh, let's say here this is a, this would be a <clears throat> uh, aldo triose here. So this is an example of an aldo with the aldehyde here. Triose with three carbons, one, two, three. This aldo triose would be considered a L carbohydrate because the hydroxyl group on the carbon that is the second to last, which happens to be the second carbon, is positioned in the left side position, whereas when it's on the right side of the Fischer projection, that is considered the D carbohydrate structure. Now, uh, amino acids are have an, an L or D designation that is analogous to that for carbohydrates. Uh, now, all amino acids have these three carbons on the main part of the chain here. Uh, and they and they also have an amine group that is connected here to this alpha carbon along with the with the uh, carboxyl group, and that amine group in naturally occurring proteins is also often on the left, and so many amino acids are referred to as L amino acids, the natural amino acids, because um, a, as an analogy to a a small carbohydrate here, where if the hydroxyl group on the left is on the left, we would call that L. And so the amino group here being on the left of the Fischer projection, we also call that L. Now here we're going to go through some examples, of, or basically we're going to go through all of the 20 amino acids that make up our bodies and those of other animals. Um, the 20 naturally occurring amino acids here. Uh, again, these are drawn a little bit differently, but you can see here is the carboxylic acid group. Here is the amine group, and this is the alpha carbon. So we said that all of the amino acids are chiral except for glycine. And the reason why glycine is not chiral is because it has two hydrogen atoms attached to the alpha carbon. The other hydrogen atom isn't drawn, but it's there. All of these are going to have a hydrogen atom attached. Uh, so this one's going to have two hydrogen atoms attached. This one also has this same hydrogen atom attached. I suppose it would be better to draw it here as a dash like this. Um, so I can erase that. Sorry, I have a cat crawling on my shoulder. Um, okay, kitty. Anyway. <laughs> uh, okay. And so the, the hydrogen, I guess, would be best to draw it on a dash here because the amine is shown on the wedge, like if we showed it on the wedge here, like like here. Now, notice that they didn't show the amine either on the wedge or the dash because it didn't matter. This carbon is not chiral, but these other two carbons are because they have four different groups attached. One is a hydrogen, and then there are three other groups. So here, glycine has a hydrogen for the side chain, and so glycine is not chiral um, because it has two of the same groups attached to the alpha carbon. Uh, now, alanine has a side chain of a methyl group. So glycine, the side chain is just a hydrogen atom. Alanine, the side chain is a methyl group. Valine, the side chain is an isopropyl group. Um, and then as you can see on the right here, there are abbreviations for each of these. So these are the structures. And generally when we're talking about glycine, we'll abbreviate it as gly or just G. And alanine is abbreviated ala or just A. Valine is, uh, is abbreviated V-A-L or just V. And all of these have something else in common. All of the ones you see here, their side chains are nonpolar. So there's only carbon and hydrogen atoms. That you know, There's obviously no polar bonds there. So these side chains are all nonpolar. Um, and a lot of the amino acids have nonpolar side chains. Here are a few more. 
Uh, we already had valine here. Valine, here's valine again. Um, there are others with nonpolar side chains. We have leucine. Leucine here. Um, uh, leucine here has a side chain, as you can see here. It contains four carbons. Uh, one, two, three, and four. Uh, it's an isobutyl group. Uh, so leucine has a side chain of an isobutyl group. Isoleucine has um, a, a side chain here as well. It's a two-butyl side chain uh, with a particular stereochemistry here. And, uh, and we can see isoleucine is abbreviated ILE or I, leucine, LEU or L. <clears throat> More amino acids with nonpolar side chains. Here, proline is an interesting one. It's unique from the others in that its side chain wraps around and connects to the amine group on the amino acid. That's unique uh, and different from many of the other, uh, other amino acids here. Uh, and so this is the side chain. The side chain is a uh, propyl group that then attaches, uh, the last carbon here attaches back to the amino group on the amino acid. A phenylalanine. Uh, here, this side chain is a benzyl group. Uh, in tryptophan, this side chain is quite large. Uh, it contains an amine here. Um, and uh, here again are their abbreviations. Uh, you can either use the three letter abbreviations or the one letter abbreviations. Uh, more commonly, the three letter abbreviations are used, really. Um, here's a f now here's some new amino acids. These amino acids have polar side chains. So all the other ones were hydrocarbons uh, mostly. Um, tri tryptophan had a nitrogen, but it's so so the reason why tryptophan is classified as a nonpolar side chain is because although it has one polar part right here, it is dominated by the nonpolar part. So we consider this a uh, a nonpolar side chain. Uh, now notice here the difference with these polar side chains, like most of the side chains, polar. We have a amide group here for asparginine, uh, very polar with this carbonyl group. We have glutamine, which is like uh, asparginine, aspar asparagine, but it has one additional carbon. Um, here, here there's one carbon, and then the amide group in glutamine, there's two carbons uh, in the chain, and then the amide group, and then serine, contains one carbon and then a hydroxyl group here. So these are the ones with the polar side chains. Here's a few more. Uh, threonine has a polar side chain that has two carbon atoms and a hydroxyl group here on the first carbon attached to the, uh, to the alpha carbon. Tyrosine has a, uh, essentially a carbon and then a phenol group attached. Cysteine. Now, cysteine is a very, uh, a very important one. Uh, cysteine is the only, the the only amino acid that contains a sulfur atom, and this sulfur atom is very, very important to the structure of proteins, as we're going to see. When we when we discuss sulfides, I didn't really go into a lot of detail in Chem 212, but one thing I said is that when sulfides are oxidized they produce a disulfide, a bond between sulfur and sulfur. And that disulfide bond is going to be extremely important to the structure of amino acids, and to the structure of proteins, rather, when these amino acids react with one another. There are uh, two amino acids with acidic side chains. They contain a carboxylic acid group on the side chain. Uh, so for aspartic acid, we have an acetyl group here for glutamic acid. We have, uh, we have two carbons and then the, the carboxylic acid group. There are also amino acids with basic side chains. So again, we saw, we saw some that were slightly acidic. I do want to go back. Like, for example, phenol is acidic, but not nearly as acidic as a car carboxylic acid. So notice the ones we call acidic, they both contain carboxylic acids. And then we called, going back, we called tryptophan a nonpolar side chain, we could consider it a basic side chain, but it's not going to be very basic because the lone pair, not only is it just a small part of this, but the lone pair is, uh, is benzylic and is, is very, uh, very effectively um, delocalized. And so it does not behave, that lone pair does not grab protons very well as a base. 
Now, when we look at our, ba our actually basic side chain, so we have a lot of amine groups. Uh, we do have a bit of delocalization here to this lone pair. There will be some resonance uh, on that, but we have this amine group here, which is, uh, uh, so we got three amine groups. So that adds to the basicity. Any of these amines could be protonated and, uh, and thus uh, absorb a proton or grab, grab a proton and behave as a base. Uh, histidine here, also a basic side chain. Now when we look at this nitrogen, this is a localized lone pair. And the quick way to see that is that when you see the lone pair in the nitrogen, but the nitrogen's already already involved in a pi bond like this, the lone pair cannot reside in the unhybridized p orbital because that unhybridized p orbital is already being used to make this pi bond. And so it's a localized lone pair in a sp2 hybridized orbital here uh, so this is this one's going to be this this lone pair will be delocalized uh, right here there will be resonance here however uh, this lone pair can definitely behave as a decent base finally we have lysine which contains four carbon atoms and then an amine group at the end and that amine group can also behave as a base and that is all 20 of the amino acids. Now our bodies can synthesize from other molecules 10 out of these 20 amino acids. But the other 10 we have to get from our diet. These are called the essential amino acids or they're often called branch chain amino acids or BCAAs as well. Um, that branch chaining being the reason why our body cannot effectively synthesize these. Um, now if you eat meat, um, the, these amino acids have already been synthesized by the organism that you are eating or their byproducts such as the meat, the fish, or their byproducts of milk and eggs. Uh, no single plant source will contain all of the essential amino acids, uh, but if you combine plant foods you can get all of the essential amino acids. So generally they say vegetarians and vegans should, pr should um, combine two out of these three sources to get a complete set of amino acids. Now there are other there are other amino acids that are not generally found in proteins, but are um, you know found in our bodies. Uh, one is referred to is called uh, gamma aminobutyric acid. It's called gamma because this is the alpha, beta, gamma carbon. So the the amine group is on the gamma carbon relative to the carboxyl group, and um, and so it's called a, a gamma amino butyric acid. The rest is here has a common name of butyric acid or we could call it butanoic acid, it would be the IUPAC naming. This is also referred to as GABA, which is a neurotransmitter in the brain. And we also have thyroxine, which is a hormone. So again, amino acid here, huge side chain. Um, yeah. So here, this is a little bit different than most amino acids, right? The amino and the amine group isn't attached to the alpha carbon, so it's not an alpha amino acid, but it is an amino acid because it has an amine and a carboxylic acid group. Um, th thyroxine is actually an alpha amino acid. It has the uh, amine at the alpha carbon, and so this would be the side chain here, a large side chain. And this is a hormone found in the thyroid gland, hence the name. In terms of the properties of amino acids, so amino acids, as their name implies, have amines, which are basic, and carboxylic acids, which are acidic. And so amino acids are both basic and acidic. Uh, now, when we look at a fully protonated amino acid, so here, this is a fully protonated amino acid. This is the kind of the structure that would exist primarily when you have a very low pH. So uh, in a very low pH or a very acidic environment, this nitrogen, the nitrogen and the amino acid will have, uh, will, will have grabbed a proton and will now be protonated. So this nitrogen will have four bonds and no lone pairs giving it a positive formal charge. Also the carboxylic acid is protonated here. So this is the form of the amino acids that exist in low pH environments. Now as you raise the pH um, eventually, first that what will first be uh, deprotonated will be the more acidic group the more acidic group here is the carboxylic acid group so the carboxylic acid group will be deprotonated 
um, and we'll have a certain pKa. So we'll call that pKa1. So that's the pKa of this acidic proton, uh, which will be lower than the pKa of the proton on the um, on the protonated amine. And so then there will be a second pKa, which is the Ka, <coughs> the the negative log of the Ka for the second uh, protein, uh, the second proton here. And now we have the fully deprotonated amino acid form. No proton attached to the nitrogen, and no proton attached where the oxygen is in the carboxyl group. So what are these pKa's? Well, as you know from previous uh, chapters, the pKa of a carboxylic acid is around two. And so the pKa1 for most amino acids is gonna be somewhere around two. It does vary slightly depending on the exact structure of the amino acid. Uh, note that the carboxylic acid is more acidic than the ammonium ion. The ammonium ion uh, will have a pKa of around 10, okay? Now, some of these acids also are, have acidic chi side chains or basic side chains. And so the, uh, this is the pKa of the side chain, which will either be the protonated ammonium part, or the, um, uh, if, if it contains it on the side chain, or the, um, the, the protonated carboxylic acid. So arginine is a basic, uh, has a basic side chain. So notice that it's, uh, its side chain proton is the least acidic with the highest pKa, right? Whereas aspartic acid, aspartic acid as the name implies, has a carboxylic acid group on the side chain, so that carboxylic acid group has a quite a low pKa, and so forth. And so we can have a number of these. Uh, here's some more for glut glutamic acid. Again, glutamic acid, look at the side chain. Low pKa due to the acidic side chain. Um, histidine here uh, having a kind of intermediate pKa side chain uh, and finally uh, leucine lysine methionine phenylalanine proline again all the all the carboxylic acid pKa's in in the amino acid that are not on the side chain around a pKa of 2ish and for the amine here uh, protonated amine somewhere around 10 uh, lysine has a basic side chain, so its side chain has a quite a high pKa for the protonated form. And finally, a few more values here. Again, around 2 for the, the alpha carboxylic acid, around 9-ish, 10-ish here for the alpha uh, uh, protonated amine. And finally, tyrosine having a basic side chain it itself has quite a high pKa2 for the protonated form. Again, this is the protonated form of the side chain. So what can we do with these pKa, pKa values? Well, you may remember from general chemistry a equation called the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, uh, which looks like this, so the log base over the acid. Uh, now, if the base and the acid uh, concentration, uh, concentrations are the same, or when the base and acid concentrations are the same, so let's say we get to a point where the pH is such that the concentration of the base equals the concentration of the acid, this will be the log of 1 then, and the log of 1 is 0. So this goes to 0 when the concentration of the base equals the concentration of the acid. <coughs> so when that is true, the pH equals the pKa. So when, and so the corollary of that is when the pH equals the pKa, then the, ba the base and the acid concentration are the same. And so for example, the carboxyl group of alanine has a pKa of 2.34. So when the pH is 2.34, half of those carboxyl groups will be protonated and half will be deprotonated. Now, physiological pH is around 7.3, 7.4. And so physiological pH is much, much higher than this. So the arrow here is indicating far to the right because at physiological pH, 
basically at higher pHs, which are more basic, you're going to have almost completely deprotonated carbox, uh, carboxylic acid groups because um, these will these will be half deprotonated at pH 2.34 and even more of them will be deprotonated at equilibrium at higher pHs. So at a physiological pH, as we saw, the carboxyl group is deprotonated and then we saw at physio uh, physiological pH, again, is 7.4, we saw that the pKa values for the protonated amines are somewhere around 9 or 10. So the pH, would, uh, for in order for half of the amines to be deprotonated, we'd have to get the pH up to around 9 or 10. So at physiological pH of around 7.4, then the carboxyl group is going to be deprotonated, as we saw before, because again the pKa was around 2.5, 2, two around 2-ish, uh, but the amine group is going to be protonated because the pKa is of those is around 9 or 10, and physiological pH is not that high. <clears throat> so here's a, an example of what's going on. If we if we raise the pH by adding base, then we can de deprotonate the protonated amine and so this would simply be a proton transfer we grab whatever base here like hydroxide grabs a proton those two lone those lone pairs are left behind on the nitrogen so we have then a nitrogen with three bonds two to hydrogen one to carbon and one lone pair so that gives it zero formal charge and the hydroxyl group picked up another hydrogen and so now it's making water <coughs> so this is what happens when we treat an amino acid with a base, we deprotonate the amino group. If we treat the um, the amino acid with an acid, then we can an acid that's stronger than carboxylic acid, for example, uh, um, <coughs> the hydronium ion. Then the carboxyl group will grab a proton from the strong acid, and then we will get <coughs> uh, the pro. And then this oxygen will then be making two bonds, one to carbon, one to hydrogen. And instead of having three lone pairs, it will now have two lone pairs. <coughs> um, so it will then have two bonds and two lone pairs, giving it zero formal charge. Now, notice that um, <coughs> I, I, I forgot to mention the word here. Uh, so as we saw, at physiological pH, the carboxyl group is deprotonated and the amino group is protonated. So the carboxyl group has a negative formal charge and the amino group has a positive formal charge. So this is a ion that is both positive and negative at the same time. This is what's referred to as a Zwitter ion, a Zwitter ion. So at physiological pHs, amino acids are Zwitter ions. <coughs> so, um, the, so, whoops. We would like to know at what pH will we have the highest concentration of the Zwitter ion, and that's going to be the, <coughs> the that's going to be the pH that's right between the pKa's of the amine group and the carboxyl group, uh, assuming that we have no side chains. So uh, as long, or sorry, assuming assuming that the side chain is neither acidic nor basic itself. So if the only acidic and basic components are the carboxyl group and the amine group, then to find the isoelectric point or the point at which the pH at which the, Zw at which the Zwitter ion concentration will be the highest, we take the average between the two pKa's. So <coughs> if the pKa of the carboxyl group is 2.34 and the pKa of the amino group is 6.96, we add them together and divide by two. So the isoelectric point for this particular uh, amino acid would be 6.02 and at that point the concentration of the Zwitter ion would be the highest. For other amino acids if they have a side chain that is acidic or basic that will definitely affect the isoelectric point. Uh, for acidic amino acids to get the isoelectric point, point you average the pKa's of the side chain which is acidic and the carboxyl group on uh, the alpha carboxyl group so this will make a much lower uh, isoelectric point in terms of pH. For basic amino acids, we to determine the 
isoelectric point will average a pKa of the uh, the protonated amine on the alpha carbon and the protonated amine on the side chain. So for example, with lysine, lysine has a basic side chain with the amine group. So to get the isoelectric point for lysine, we average the pKa's of the protonated alpha amine and the protonated uh, side chain amine, which are both you know around nine or ten. So we average them, and we get an isoelectric point around you know nine nine or ten, right? <clears throat> for a for a amino acid with an acidic side chain, for example, glutamic acid, uh, it has a, car a carboxyl group on the side chain and the alpha carboxyl group. So the alpha carboxyl group has a pKa of about 2.19 here, in this case in glutamic acid. The, um, <clears throat> the side chain carboxyl group has a pKa of 4.25. So to get the isoelectric point for glutamic acid, we, we average the two. We add them up and divide by two. Of course, we get a much lower um, isoelectric point with this additional acidity here. So why do we care about this isoelectric point? Well, there is a very efficient way of separating amino acids for research pur purposes, and this is called electrophoresis. <clears throat> and this is huge for separating various amino acids or even polypeptides or proteins. So what we do is we put a mixture of amino acids on a... Um, on a kind of like paper or film or something that is <clears throat> coated with a some type of um, solution and then we put an electrical potential across either side of this film that with the uh, solvent here and one of the sides will have the positive electrical potential and the other side will have the negative p electrical potential and the po the we set the pH to a certain value and if the pH is greater than the isoelectric point, that means that the, all, uh, the groups will generally be more deprotonated. They'll be deprotonated, so the carboxyl group will be deprotonated. So this is where, <coughs> uh, uh, so when the pH is very high, uh, we're going to have the carboxyl group here um, deprotonated. We're going to have the... Um, and we will have the amino acid group here as the cation. Okay. Um, when the pH is let, when the pi, so when the pi is greater than the pH, rather, the pH is low. The amino acid will be uh, <coughs> will be protonated, and the carboxyl group will be protonated. So in this form, we're going to have the amino group will be protonated. So it will be positive. However, the carboxyl group will be also protonated, which will mean that it is neutral. So the entire, uh, the entire amino acid will be a cation. It will be positive, And thus, it will move to the negative electrode. So let's say that we have the electrophoresis going at pH 6. For lysine, the isoelectric point is 9.74. <clears throat> and so here the the pH is less is uh, is lesser than the isoelectric point, meaning that the amine group is protonated, the carboxyl group is protonated. So this ion is positive, so it's going to move and travel towards the negative electron. It will be attracted towards the negative electron. Uh, for alanine, let's say, if we're at pH 6, well, that's about the same as the isoelectric point for alanine, so it's not really going to move much at all. However, for glutamic acid, its isoelectric point is 3.22. So in that case, its isoelectric point is less than the pH. What does that mean for glutamic acid? Well, <clears throat> that means that both groups are going to be deprotonated. The pH is low, right? Uh, PI, uh, so uh, the, the, the isoelectric point here is lower than the pH. So we'd have to get it to a lower pH in order to uh, to protonate the, the carboxyl group. So our carboxyl group at this higher pH is going to be deprotonated. So it will be negative in charge. 
also, also our amino group will also be deprotonated because they, it would be m more protonated if the pH were lower, but the pH is 6. And for it to be, for half of them to be protonated, we'd have to be down at pH 3.2. So overall, we've got a negative charge here. It's anionic. <clears throat> and so this glutamic acid at pH 6 will be anionic and will move and travel towards the positive charge electrode, which is referred to as the anode uh, here in the cations here, uh, the, the cathode. So if two am amino acids have similar PI values um, and, and we're having trouble separating them, we can tell the difference because the larger amino acid will move more slowly. And so this is the ways that we can separate amino acids for research purposes. It's not really suitable for large amounts uh, of, of uh, proteins. There are other methods, one being uh, gel electrophoresis, which are very commonly used in, in biomedical research. Uh, electrophoresis, as I said, is an analytical technique, analytical scale technique, meaning you can't use it for large amounts, uh, but it's useful for research. Amino acids are generally colorless, but if you want to note their presence, you can react them with a common reagent called the ninhydrin reagent. Uh, the ninhydrin reagent will act with the react with the amino group here, and will produce this larger complex, which is purple in color, and so we can see the presence of amino acids by reaction with the ninhydrin agent and the or ninhydrin uh, reagent and the presence of the purple color. So now we've talked about the properties of amino acids. We talked about their identities and their side chains. The fact that they're all the natural amino acids have a stereochemistry that is indicated as L uh, and with reference to the analogous uh, small carbohydrates, which are all D in nature. We talked about the various side chains that exist in the 20 amino acids, which amino acids are the essential amino acids, and we also talked about the way in, in which um, pH affects the charge of the amino acids and how that can be useful for separating them via, capo, uh, via electrophoresis. When we go into the next lecture, we'll begin to talk about the kinds of reactions that can be used to produce amino acids from uh, organic molecules and by, by organic synthesis. And so I look forward to telling you about that in the next video.